Christmas training here, and we have an hour, almost two hours of that, and half of it will be um, mindfulness, uh, both sort of like, they don't call them Dharma talks, but basically, you know, um, op uh, starting it, and then actually mindfulness sessions too. And climate Are resilience- Are they being taught through, you're teaching them at UC Santa Barbara, even though it's the San Diego group? So it, it's, UC, it's a UC wide course. And actually okay. it's being taught at every UC campus, and Summer and I are the two people here. And um, San Diego, they're the ones who put the grant together and got the funding and all for it. And also did the logistics, and they created a UC-wide canvas for it and all. So it's pretty oh cool. It's an experiment. Who knows what will happen, but I'm, I'm pretty excited. So you start that in the fall? That's when it's um, No, we're starting that Friday. Next... Friday, the day after tomorrow. Oh, my God. Yeah. We've been, we've been having, um, all the UC participants have been meeting every other week by way of Zoom in our new Sangha. So we have, a, uh, so yeah. we're not instructors, it's the uh, meditation instructors and us, and we all have a, uh, a pretty cozy little Sangha, so. I would love um, to hear more about that. So maybe I'll reach out to Summer too and see if I can get yeah. my hands on what you're doing, because I want to develop something like that here for sure. Yeah, well, I'll let you know how it goes. Um, the nice thing is it's a flipped class, so they have um, all sorts of people pre-recorded little talks, and then the students will be watching those, and then we're going to come in and talk about them. But they got great people, like uh, John Kabat-Zinn is one of them. Uh, John Kabat-Zinn, John is actually doing a, um, um, a live Zoom session with us, too, in addition to pre-recording, so... Yeah. Pretty, uh, well, the, the joys of being at the UC. <laughs> oh, it, it's not normally that way. <laughs> I, I, That's that incredible. It was. Grant, I'd be curious who's running it out in San Diego. Who, who's the sort of um, spearhead of that? <laughs> so most people are here, but we'll um, Great. still give them a couple minutes. Yeah, cool. I had a nice chat with Summer recently. She was talking about trying to put together um, some ideas and wanted my feedback. And it's just so nice to connect with her again. I really loved her when I met her through the can. And yeah, um, yeah she's wonderful. Well, her, her book is out, I guess you know. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Um, actually I didn't ask her, but I presume uh, her review will be in the fall, which I am sure will fly through. Yes, yes, yes. She's just done everything and beyond, as well, it sounds like. But yeah. of course, I'm not in the campus, so I can't tell what's happening. But she seems such a such an amazing colleague, and I imagine a great instructor, you know, with students. Yeah. I love that she's taking this turn towards film. She's really gotten into the film stuff, and that's something that um, we have some really great stuff happening on this campus too. I'd love to create some kind of film thing happening here too. I have no skill in that area, but <laughs> it's nice to know people. <laughs> I, I couldn't quite hear you at the room, so I just put in my earbuds. So okay. that may be better. But Great. when everyone it feels comes like just down, an interesting conversation between us, so <laughs> yeah. So how is the view of the room now? Does it look better? Yeah, I can really see. Yeah, the shut doors makes a big difference. Yeah. Great, good to know, so. Yeah. It must be warm there. <laughs> warm? It is, it's, um, I, I biked in and it's like 65 to great, but I think it's going to be warmer. So not so warm and humble? <laughs> nope. Okay. We're ready though. We had a good we had a very sunny weekend and I got to do a lot of really nice things in the sun, so it was great. Cool. Oh great. Okay, let me get them started then. Yep. Okay. So everyone take a seat. So I actually move back over here while I'm talking. So this um Echoing in my own head. Stop. All right, I have to take my earbuds off. Okay, this is going to be the normal format that we have from now on. Every week we're going to have a speaker who'll be, every day we're going to have a speaker who'll be up here. 
We're going to have closed captioning there. Um, Sarah, just allow me to do this for one minute. Um, we're now taking roll. So let me hit the eye clicker here. Hit poll. Hit this. Select. Capture. One. Uh, Sarah, normally you won't hear me do that. You might hear me. You might see me talking, but I'll, I'll mute my mic when I do it um, for the class. But, or maybe I won't be able to, we'll see. This is why we're gonna figure everything out this class. But anyhow, so um, we're taking uh, attendance three times today. Make sure you sign in with your app. If you have a problem, see your TA at the end of class, they'll be up front. Anyhow, it's our great pleasure to welcome Sarah Ray. Sarah, class, can we welcome Sarah? So where we are, Sarah, we're in the middle of reading your book, Field Guide to Climate Anxiety. It's assigned for the first week. Students have to have it finished by Sunday night to make a comment. But already, there are dozens of comments that are here um, that I can look at and I'll be drawing from. Um, for everyone in the room, also note that the Q&A is now open for lecture number two. Um, if you have questions for Sarah, um, yep. Oh, there's already a question waiting. It just popped up. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask some of my own first. Um, <laughs> keep the Q&A is just for questions for Sarah. If you have other technical questions, eye clicker things, put them in the course Q&A. Um, but so you'll get questions both on the text, but also there'll be some people in the room, Sarah, who haven't started it yet, probably. So in a way, this is good because it'll both kind of frame things for people and then answer questions for people as well. So I thought I would start. My little thing just slipped down. I think it's too heavy with my phone. OK. So Sarah, I think I'd start with the same question I asked you last year. By the way, to everyone, this is Sarah's third year visiting us. Very gracious for her to do so. But um, how you got interested in all this, and you can take that however you want it, whether it's environmental issues, climate issues, or the specific issue of climate anxiety. Sure. So everyone can hear me OK? Yeah? Yeah, OK. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks so much for your attention. I'm really honored that you're reading my book and that Ken brings it up for this class. And this is the third year. Um, seems like the book uh, came out right in the peak of the youth climate action and climate strikes around the world. And I couldn't predict that. I had no idea that that was um, something kind of bubbling right under the surface that was going to explode about a year before the book came out while I was in the throes of writing it. So. Uh, definitely hit a nerve that I'm I'm grateful for, also sad about, because of course what it means is that there's a lot of people feeling debilitatingly anxious about about climate change, and a lot of those people are young people, according to the data, and they're of course not just my students in my class. There's the students in classes all across the the world and country for sure, um, and there's super interesting data that has come out since the attention around youth climate anxiety has happened. There's a lot of really interesting data around that. I can um, give you some of that in numbers if it becomes interesting later. But to answer the question how I got interested in it, sometime around 2013, 14, 15, in that time frame, I had just started this job here at Cal Poly Humboldt. And the sort of normal things that I would teach students, I would bring in lots of information about environmental justice is my main area of interest, but I also have an environmental humanities background, which is how I got to know Ken. And I was trained in this field of thinking about how is the environment represented in popular culture and texts and literature, and to get people to care more about environmental issues. And the sort of going way of teaching about environmental issues, which you may have experienced maybe in AP environmental science during high school, or even in some of your classes in college, the teachers tend to come to environmental topics from a perspective of students need to know more information, they need to know the science, they need to know the data, they need to know how bad things are, and then the implication being that once I convey all that as the educator, they will then know what to do with how bad things are and this terrible information, and they will go out into the world and become the fixers and solvers of these problems. But there it turns out that this, is, this was backfiring on me and backfiring on lots of educators, I think, Students were actually increasingly at that point starting to come in. There was like a shift happening in what students were getting 
before they got to college, all of a sudden they were getting a lot more of that information about how bad the climate crisis is before they were even entering college. And so they were actually getting apathetic, nihilistic, despairing. The doom and gloom stuff that was getting taught to them in most of their classes was actually having the effect of turning them off from the topic, making them walk into the door and realize that we're talking about something terrible and walk back out again. And frankly, um, creating a situation where we already had a pretty terrible mental health crisis happening among young people and college age people. But in, from my perspective, I was wondering how much of that might actually be what they're learning in their classes <laughs> about how terrible things are in the world and how, how messed up our political system is and how the rise of authoritarianism is happening and, and how bad the climate crisis is, among many other problems that they're getting much more information about at a much earlier stage than just in their college classes. And so I started to ask this question, what is the environmental educator's role now? If it's not to sort of dump all this terrible information of doom and gloom onto students, and students are already getting a lot of that doom and gloom, maybe in fact, we have to do something the opposite or at least temper it somewhat, or at least maybe bring some of the insights from psychology into what is happening in our environmental classrooms. Because most environmental educators are not trained in psychology. They're not trained in the neuroaffective science of education and learning. You'd think that we all would be, but in newsflash, most people who get a PhD and then come and teach classes never learn anything about teaching, much less psychology of learning. So it turns out the psychologists were studying climate psychology were way ahead of the game on this one. They were already figuring out things like ecological melancholia, or terms like solastalgia, or notions about why it is that people who are, when they're inundated with doom and gloom, would turn off and not want to participate in climate action and actually has the opposite effect of what educators were sort of hoping it would have, beating students over the head with how bad things are, hoping they get motivated to fix the problems. And so those folks were doing a lot of interesting research on that. My students were having a lot of apathy and despair. I felt like what was something drastically was shifting in the classroom. And so to get to your question, Ken, I decided I needed to go research what those climate psychologists were all talking about and figure out what it meant for what was happening in college classrooms. And so that the book really is the answer to that question. Um, of course, it's designed for more than just college classrooms. It's really written for what I consider the climate generation, um, people who are concerned primarily in, in a sort of big way as a number one of the top three concerns of your generation is climate change. Um, this is the first time that's ever happened. Climate change has had a really big PR problem getting people to care about it, actually. Historically, you might be surprised to, to learn that because you may care a lot about climate change. Um, but it's new. It's new that people would care so much, and it really is a distinctive quality of your generation. And so what I was really concerned about was how are we going to change this big problem? How are we going to teach an entire generation or motivate an entire generation if you all are checked out because it's too awful to even face? Um, so the book really tries to make an intervention and, and push back against that possibility. Yeah. Um, first off, that's a terrific answer, Sarah. And by the way, one that I noticed too. So I mean, I used to, because I've been doing this for uh, almost 20 years, um, I used to start with the science trying to convince people how bad it was. And up until I actually included um, an article I'm sure you're aware of by David Wallace Wells at some point in class, who just laid out all the problems as possibly, and, and including literally being cooked alive and how this would actually play out. And suddenly I realized um, that message was already out there. And I turned away from the sciences too, in the same way that, that you did, to um, psychology and social sciences as well, especially the um, uh, um, sort of non-quantitative. So let me ask a question then, Sarah. So we all, I mean, everyone in the room here knows the climate crisis is an issue, believes it. It's not everyone in the United States, for sure, but everyone in this room, I think I'm pretty confident of that. So how big, an, how big a problem is climate anxiety? Because this that you're speaking to, 800 plus people are the climate generation, and if the studies are right, these folks think about the climate crisis a lot, like daily. How, but how big a problem is it? I'm just curious. And, and does it skew differently for different generations? You, I know that you know that that's kind of a tricky question. <laughs> it sounds like such a, how big is it? It's big. Okay, next question. Um, obviously not, right? It's so complicated. So um, it's sticky. And I, I'm sure you have some of your own thoughts about it too. One day I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. 
So I would go, um, I would, the research that I've been doing kind of recently suggests that a significant reason, the, the vast majority of college students are getting their climate news and their climate information outside of college classes, which is really interesting. This is the work of folks like Krista Heiser and stuff. And so if the vast majority of the, the news that young people are consuming is coming from, as we know, these kind of algorithmic designed news sources that are channeled through and mediated through social media, there are all kinds of incentives and desires around those designs of how people are getting channeled that kind of information that is not at all about trying to get out the best or most accurate information. It certainly is not about anybody's, anybody on the consumer's end's mental health. Um, and so there's all kinds of problems that I'm sure this, the folks in the room are aware of, even if that's still the way that most of us get, are getting our news. So it's a concern to me to think about the, the mediums and channels through which young people are actually learning the most that they know about climate change. Of course, the vast majority of that is gonna be in the category of doom and gloom, spectacular, horrible things, um, news coming from all corners of the globe 24 hours a day about how terrible climate change is. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that um, climate anxiety is very, very high among people who are getting their news in this particular way. Which isn't to say that the climate crisis is not a big problem and that those things are not happening. But I think attention to how it is that we're figuring out what story is happening out there is, is really an important part of the process of getting climate literacy happening. And I think it's more important just not for climate literacy, but also for our mental health. So if we're living in a soup and a marinating in stories where doom and gloom is around every corner and terrible things are happening all the time, it is really actually psychologically very diff difficult to get up and do some work and participate and be part of the actions that are required to address and stem those problems and mitigate or much less adapt to climate change. So it's a big problem, sure, but it's probably magnified much greater than all of the work that's happening to fix it. If we live in a story where the problems are really, really big and there's no one out there solving them, we think, you know, we love that. There's this sort of famous story about um, Mr. Rogers' moms telling him that the way that he can get through all the terrible things that are happening with children all around the world is if he looks for the helpers. So that one of the problems with most of the climate news that we consume is that there's no helpers, there's nobody doing the solutions, there's nobody fixing the problems. We don't even think that most people care. There's this really interesting research that's come out um, recently that if we don't think we're surrounded by people who care as much as we care, we are less likely to actually engage in the work so the perception of other people not caring is a, it has very material important consequences on our inaction um, and our psychological well-being. So how big of it is a problem? Climate change, of course, is a huge problem. It's magnified by the ways that we're consuming the stories about it. The psychology of how we interact with the bigness of the problem turns into something that psychologists call pseudo-inefficacy, which is if we think the problem is really big, we're less likely to try to solve that problem. So the bigness of the problem is, a, is, is relative based on um, how it's mediated to us. Uh, how big is climate anxiety as a problem? I think is a significantly large problem. There is a debate out there about whether or not it's a good thing to have climate anxiety or a bad thing to have climate anxiety. Um, on the side of it's a good thing, folks are saying we need more people to have climate anxiety because that will turn them into acting on it and motivate them to do things. If they're, if they're feeling some fight, flight, or freeze around climate, they're more likely to act on it than if they're just sort of cooking in the warming water as the frog would, right? So the urgency of climate change makes us super anxious, will make us do something about it, and so therefore it's a good thing. On the other side of that argument, folks are saying climate anxiety is a bad thing because climate anxiety is very debilitating and actually gets in the way of effective climate action. So I, I don't know where you all stand on that. Um, I have a little bit of a mixed place on that. I can see both sides of that. So yeah, and it's definitely across, you asked about generations too. Um, it turns out that across generations, in general, young people care more than older people, but that's not very pronounced, uh, depending on what pol political party you're in, that generationally is um, really only radically different or statistically significantly different uh, if you are um, in the GOP or the or, or Republican Party. So the difference in the Republican Party between young people and older people around climate change is really significant. Yeah. 
Um, so thanks for that. And I knew you weren't going to just say real big. I was hoping you'd give me an answer, um, which, is, which is great. And by the way, if people want to weigh in on this at all, the Q&A is open. We're already getting questions in there. And plus, I have other comments from the um, comments. But let me ask you one last thing, Sarah, is sort of a broaching question here. Um, a big one, um, just like the last one. Um, OK, climate crisis, real. Climate anxiety, real. And that's thanks to you and others who actually put a name on it so we can now start talking about it. Because before, it wasn't like it didn't exist. It's just we didn't quite know about it. I mean, I'm thinking what well, you mentioned in the book, like Daniel Goleman's, the idea of emotional um, you know, intelligence. People always had or didn't have that. But by, un by putting a name on it and making it recognizable, that's terrific. But my question is, OK, what do we do about climate anxiety? I know you wrote a book about it. I know people are going to have individual questions about it. But it just is the first pass, if you want to yeah. weigh in on that. Yeah. Yeah, the first pass, when I think about, OK, if I were to take one of the things in the book that is like the first one, the lowest hanging fruit, the easiest thing to tackle, it's not the only solution, but I do think it's a significant step towards easing the, the sort of urgency anxiety that we have, the kind of what um, mindfulness instructors and, and people who are thinking about the, neuro, the neuroscience of, of threat and risk perception is the kind of amygdala hijack mode, right? So many of my students are in constant amygdala hijack whether it's because they don't have food security, whether they don't have housing, they're in a constant fight with family or roommates or whatever, there's, there's almost an inability to even think about some of the larger questions that we're talking about in class, much less climate anxiety, just feels like it throws their existing mental health problems into a whole different sphere. And so to me, the immediate solution to that is a similar kind of solution that therapists would talk about in terms of anxiety, which is you can't face the problems that are in your life, much less climate change, if you're in that particular state. Um, there are some folks who talk about the window of tolerance. Uh, Dan Siegel is a psychologist who talks about making sure that if you're going to be able to uh, show up to particular actions and be your wisest self and do the most um, effective thing in service of your values and what you care about, if you want your prefrontal cortex to be fully online and act in, in the most wise ways for the long-term you and the long-term future and the common good, you actually have to be completely emotionally regulated. And so Dan Siegel talks about if you're in your window of tolerance, your body, your nervous system is regulated and you're able to do those kinds of things. But if you are knocked out of your window of tolerance, if you're hypo or hyper, hyper aroused, you're going to be in a state of anger or reactivity and not be able to think wisely. And so I'd say that the getting yourself regulated and get yourself uh, have that window of tolerance be as big and strong as you can make it. Um, some people who are in trauma-informed therapy would call that a range of resilience rather than a window of tolerance. Um, but it's the idea that you can't be doing this kind of work if you're not regulated, if you're not okay, and so to get yourself okay. That's the lowest hanging fruit. That's the one that comes out of therapy, right? But then specific to climate, I think we need to actively live in a world surrounded by lots of people, knowing that we're part of a big chorus of people who are doing this work not alone, the feeling, the, the, the source of our sense of anxiety about climate is less to do with how bad climate change is and more to do with our feeling that we can't do anything about it, inefficacy, the fact that nobody cares. So the despair really comes from the world is headed in this direction and people are just not looking up, right? To refer to that film, Don't Look Up, the entire critique of that film, Don't Look Up, was about people wanting to be in denial. Right? And so if we go around the world thinking nobody cares, everybody's not plugged into this, um, I'm alone in the wilderness on this one, that is really the source of our despair. And there's really interesting research in psychology that shows that if you plug into community, a collective, and recognize that you are not alone in your impact, that your impact is magnified, if you start to sort of take control a little bit over the power that you do have instead of constantly believing what capitalism wants you to believe, which is that you're powerless, you are much more likely to feel ease around the climate anxiety, regardless of whether or not you are collectively um, changing climate change or not. So the important thing there, the kind of take home point on the research is to act in collective and worry less about the instrumental, am I doing something that makes a difference? That question is sort of the wrong question. It gives us a red herring. We're down the wrong path if we're going down that way. The actual solution or the ease for climate anxiety is to participate in a collective and be surrounded by people you know care as much as you do, which is actually turns out to be an incredible amount of people. 
Boy, two terrific answers to that. And um, I would add on the first one, um, a lot of people aren't, a lot of people know about mindfulness today. And in fact, I just mentioned to you, Summer Gray and I are teaching a mindfulness course in climate right now. Um, but most people don't know where it came from in a modern sense. And one of the big, you know, uh, movements came from Thich Nhat Hanh, who was dealing with what was happening during Vietnam. He was with social workers, the Buddhist monks and monastics as social workers. And they were getting entirely burned out because they just didn't have the resiliency to deal with that, which was another catastrophic problem. Problem. And his diagno diagnosis of mindfulness as a way to get us, you know, sort of collected and, and able to deal with it proved to be remarkable and, and is remarkably a big deal right now. The, the other thing you mentioned, Sarah, I just want a, a little teaser for the rest of the class. We have one session coming up with folks from our own sustainability office where we will be introducing literally dozens of different groups and activities on campus that you can get involved in. So if you just heard what Sarah said and get involved and you think, well, how can I get involved? Stay tuned, we'll, we'll do that. Um, okay, so Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to students to start asking questions now. And the question, I don't wanna, because um, this is the main purpose of this, so that you, know, you are basically lecturer today, I'm just you know, facilitating it. But if people have questions, you're the expert. So here we go, first one. A lot of social movements have faced stressful and horrible situations. How come our emotional response is only becoming debilitating now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say, first of all, one of the first places that I went to when I when my students were despairing and feeling debilitated, I thought, where is our collective amnesia on this? Why can't we learn from the various movements that have definitely faced terrible things in the past and seem to have resilience to carry on and keep doing the work? And it was amazing to read um, the work of folks, the, the sort of famous people we all are familiar with who are leaders in these movements, but even like the stories about just the, the sort of, you know, grunt work of getting these movements to happen and where people, how movements actually dealt with bad news and, and um, a sense that their movements were not going to have the results that they hoped. And it turns out that that sense of despair and debilitation was in fact characteristic of all these other movements as well. And the sense of, I don't know if what we're gonna do is gonna work, but I have to do it anyway, that kind of, um, uh, optimism of spirit, pessimism of, pessimism of intellect kind of thing, right? Like, it's not going to work, but I have to do it anyway, right? Um, and so I wouldn't say the debilitation aspect is new. I would say that that is, that is a characteristic of social movements in the past. And that the thing that has, the thing that is kind of new, um, and this is, I speculate about this a little bit in my book, and I bring it out more in, in later articles that I've written around the racial dimensions of climate anxiety, but that the climate movement in general has been very much a, come from, the origins of that movement have been coming from a very privileged elite, right? The people who can afford to think about things like polar bears. And that's a, that all this stuff I'm sort of putting as a myth, this was the assumption that climate change, if that's the concern that you are worried about, that means that you don't have other more immediate concerns right in front of your face. That is an abstract future, far distant kind of a concern. It's not, um, you know, inability to pay my rent or inability to put food on the table or losing my job or any other kinds of threats that are more, much more immediate, like a fire in front of your face that you have to put out. So the sense of climate change being a privileged concern and the movement itself coming out of um, more from the sciences and more from people who are from the global north and more from an elite group has meant that in that, that, that legacy is still with the climate movement. It hasn't shed that legacy just because justice movements in the last five or six years have actually shaped and rechanged the climate movement to add the word justice. Doesn't mean that that legacy of the privilege of the climate movement isn't still with it. And from that movement, there have not been a whole lot of resilience um, practices because th those folks have been the people who have been the colonizers, been the people who have been benefiting from industrial extraction. So there hasn't been the same kind of existential threat to these, these people who have been in that movement. And so the climate justice movement, one of the things that the, that's happening, this beautiful thing of the marrying of these movements is that the traditions and practices of resilience from these other movements from the global south, from people who have been on the front lines of all kinds of injustices, not just environmental injustices, have had to figure out how to pick up and build resilience and to create collective energy even when evidence suggests that they're not gonna get anywhere with that fight. And so those practices and those insights are now kind of getting transferred and seeping into the climate movement 
um, in pretty, pretty amazing ways. There's also conflict along those lines. There's questions of appropriation. There's all kinds of um, other kind of stickier issues that I think come up, like your particular set of, the way that you frame climate change is not the way I frame climate change, or maybe people from a more privileged perspective are still thinking of climate change in terms of just carbon emissions and what's in the air, you know, like what they call carbon tunnel vision, whereas more justice oriented movements are thinking about a systemic analysis of how all of the different problems that we're facing are interconnected. Um, can we can we attack climate change without attacking questions of inequality and justice? These questions are still being negotiated and they're still they're still battled out in the climate movement. But the practices for emotional resilience, the practices for thinking that you're living in a story where something the arc is bending towards justice, as Martin Luther King famously said, right? Um, that those kinds of practices of the heart and of the soul and the and, and of the body have actually been increasingly shaping the climate movement um, and they are really drawing on these other justice movements. I would say though that the, debil the sense of debilitation and, and having pessimism of intellect, like this isn't gonna go anywhere, we have no evidence that this is gonna work, um, that that has been a constant. Yeah, well, that's that's terrific. And um, just another teaser with respect to justice, our friend David Pello will probably be coming to class to actually flesh that whole subject out in, in detail. I was just teaching him this week, yesterday in class. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Cool. Um, so what I'm doing, uh, Sarah, you can't see, your class can't see, I'm bouncing back and forth between actual questions and I'm looking at comments that people have already made after reading your book and they focus on different things. So I just want to throw out some of the things that people have been focusing on, uh, which they thought was a really important takeaway for, for, for the book from them. And the first is a um, person really spends a lot of time talking about the concept of anticipatory grief. What is anticipatory grief? Yeah, so there's some, again, always some debate about whether this is a useful concept or not, but I do think putting language around emotions and the earth is a really good idea, and I would um, really give a, a, a hat tip to um, the work of Glenn Albrecht, and he's got a book called Earth Emotions, and he's got this whole lexicon that he calls Psychoterratica, like language, words around psychology and the earth, right? Um, and Anticipatory grief is a concept that he's also playing around with. He doesn't really like the word grief, actually. Um, and then there's this idea of anticipatory, suggesting that this is about the future loss of something, and I'm having a grief about something I'm going to lose in the future. That's basically the concept of anticipatory grief. And one of the reasons why um, that is so prevalent around climate anxiety is because uh, folks are really concerned about maybe species, communities, the losses that are to come rather than the ones that I'm experiencing now or have experienced in the past. So anticipatory grief is one of the really strong um, flavors in this sort of soup of climate anxiety um, for a lot of people. And I think it's particularly strongest for folks who, for whom the grief of the losses of environmental services or environmental relationships um, hasn't actually happened yet or they don't perceive them because they're insulated from them. And so some folks would push back on anticipatory grief and say there's, some, there's a little element of privilege attached to that because for most folks on the planet, um, the grief and the losses are already happening and have not already happened. And it's only a very small group of, of people who can imagine that they are not experiencing those things yet or, or in fact have not experienced those things yet. So the, temp the temporal tenor of these different emotions is really key. In fact, even the concept of climate anxiety, as and people who study emotions will tell you, anxiety by its very de definition it is only can be only about something that's gonna happen in the future. If it's something that's right in front of us that we're dealing with in the present moment, um, people who study emotions would call that a worry. Worry or concern is a different thing than anxiety on this very question of temporality. So if something's gonna be, if anxiety is the way you're feeling about it, then by definition, it's about something in the future. And so again, who has the privilege of not feeling like they are experiencing climate change right now, right? Or who, for whom is it only a future worry um, rather than a current problem? And these things are very much divided on, on lines of class and race and geographical location and, and how much of a privilege we have to insulate ourselves from the costs of climate change that are happening right now. So yeah, anticipatory grief, climate anxiety, all of these things are fascinating in large part because of what they signal about temporality, when and where and how the risks that we perceive are going to affect us. 
Uh, yeah, I think we'll get to that question of temporality again, but I should note that the questions are really coming in now, so I'm okay. just going to go I'll right start, to... I'll start making my answers shorter, Ken. <laughs> oh, no, no. This, you're an ideal person because you just you you flesh so much out, so keep doing that, keep doing that. Um, okay. But the next one is, how do, you, how do you, I'm not sure whether it's you, Sarah, or you, everyone, how do you find a balance of emotion and science, considering emotion and bias almost always gets in the way of true factual science? Well, what a great question. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to go with me on that one. How does Sarah do that? Um, and let you all decide how you all will do that. Because um, I, I, I'm i nervous about too much heavy duty hand, heavy handing prescription because I'm already giving a lot of that today. Um, so how do I deal with it? Uh, one of the things that I think is implicit in that question is an assumption that science and emotion are two polar ends of some spectrum. And that um, there's this idea that emotion is irrational, therefore, right? That somehow emotion does not tap into some kind of wisdom that is, in fact, quite rational. And I, as a person who was raised in dominant culture, I carry a lot of that bias about emotion with me. And I do, in fact, sometimes have moments where I think, God, I wish I wasn't so emotional. It's just getting in the way of my productivity, my ability to participate in capitalism, my ability to not care about what these people think about me and let that drag me down, or all of the things that we think of emotion as getting in the way of us being able to do. And then, of course, the entire enterprise of science or the sort of institution of science is built on this presumption that emotions do not shape our, our inquiry. Oh, do you, are you talking to me, Ken? Sorry. I hear you. Talk, I see you talking, but I can't hear oh, you. Oh, yeah. No, I actually turned it off so you couldn't hear me. I was telling the class that we're taking oh, Okay, you're doing your own thing. Okay. <laughs> I should have <laughs> walked out of the scene for a minute. On. <laughs> Yeah. So this, I, the, the, the uh, question itself carries a little bit of that assumption with it, that something about emotion is getting in the way of productivity, getting in the way of, of objective inquiry. And if we take a science class, we're oftentimes told to not include I in our writing, right? The subjective perspective is considered not truth. Um, and from a humanities background, the perspective I come from is really trying to push against that, is really trying to push against uh, forward the fact that your personal truth is a kind of truth, that there's only subjective truth really out there. So there's a there's two answers to that question. One is to sort of challenge the entire assumption in the beginning that there is any such thing as objectivity and that emotion is not, you know, in its own sense, rational. The second answer to that kind of goes a very different direction, which is to say, there is science of emotion <laughs> too, right? That there's a scientific way of understanding emotions. And in fact, the science of emotions is probably more important for us to, in order to do anything around climate change than the science of climate. And that's the sort of proposition I wanna leave on the table. Is it possible that the science of emotions and the world of emotions in people, humans, messy humans, messy societies that have to actually get organized to fix this problem, perhaps the science of emotions might be a more important tool, objectively speaking. That's a great answer. Um... We could jump right to the next one. What do you think are what do you think are the most effective ways to bring stability to people's emotions regarding climate change? Specifically, what would need to change in classrooms and media? And the the first part of what you said got cut off to to help people with climate anxiety or uh, yeah, mean? the most effective ways to bring stability to people's emotions stability. regarding climate change. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So um, the first question I would ask about that question is, what is the emotional state that is required in order for people to be able to do the most effective work around climate change? And I'm not entirely sure stability is the answer to that. So I'm not sure if stability is our goal here. Maybe I'm wrong. I could be wrong. It's for some people, very much maybe. Maybe I think a lot of people have a varying wide range of tolerances out there among people, among even this class, about how much instability you can tolerate. And I think people can still operate from their window of tolerance, even when there's great instability. Um, again, instability can knock many of us right out of our window of tolerance very quickly if instability has that kind of trigger for us. And the goal, therefore, being to widen our range of tolerance, our window of tolerance, to be able to tolerate 
instability greater? Um, I think that I would, my answer to that question would be, can we learn how to tolerate instability more so we can continue to act from instability? Because instability, I think, is going to be increasingly the norm. Um, that said, I hear underneath that question the sort of desire for, if I don't have stability, I won't be able to do anything, which was past my classes, you know? So yeah, yes, there, there is some, some sort of bar we need to at least achieve there on that stability. And I think for, for classrooms, one of the ways that um, faculty or teachers sort of call at this moment, this moment that we're in, what's the calling of education right now, may not be directly around this, this goal of stability, but around really focusing on what is the sort of hidden emotional curriculum that we're teaching. I think that's what goes back to my first introductory comments about the hidden emotional curriculum of most environmental educators is very destabilizing. So can we bring to the surface and bring to light and have more ownership and recognition around what is it that we're emotionally doing to our students in classrooms? And does that equip them to do the kinds of things that we want them to do in their lives? And so stability may or may not be the answer to that. I, my personal uh, conclusion after all this research is to say a sense of efficacy in a collective that those are the things that do the most for making students feel empowered to do the kinds of things we want them to do. Stability may be for some students and not for others. I think there's much more of a range there, but the one that's easy, most easily generalized, generalizable across um, most students, I'd say, is, is a sense of efficacy and a feeling of being a collective, which are connected, which are related to each other. Um, and yeah, I think faculty and educators need to be much more real about all of the traumas, difficulties, challenges, mental health landscape, of what students are bringing into the classroom a lot more than they have been in the past. Most faculty, I'm still getting this in all kinds of spaces because I actually am on the brink of publishing a new book that's about to come out this month actually, um, which is called How to Teach in a Burning World. So it's about taking the insights of the book you're reading and sort of offering some advice for faculty. And the vast majority of pushback that I get around from faculty is, I'm not a therapist. I can't deal with students' emotions. I don't want, I don't want things to get emotional in my classroom. Well, newsflash, things are already really emotional in the classroom. You all are not just separated heads, even though I can look out there and all I see are heads. <laughs> but you're not all just heads disconnected from your body and your heart. And you bring those heart and those bodies into the classroom, whether we like it or not. And so do I as a faculty member and every faculty member. This pretense that we can just operate at the level of the cerebral is just false. Um, and in fact, we should be harnessing students' emotional lives in order to do better in our classes. So uh, I think a little more attention to that would be my answer to that question, even though it didn't really get to this goal of stability. I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, I don't know if we can hope for stability as our norm uh, for in the coming years. Yeah, yeah, and, and only because the world is not going to be stable and we're not sure what's going to be happening anyhow, so anyhow. That's uh, what I mean, yeah. <laughs> So, so let me jump to the next one. Um, do you think having a nihilistic philosophy on the climate crisis and completely denying its existence has similar negative impacts on the climate movement itself? Yeah, that's a great question. I actually think those two things are totally different, being nihilistic versus being in denial. Um, so uh, I think nihilism means you've, you've really faced it with very clear eyes and, and realize the, your own powerlessness, powerlessness in the situation and have decided to just check out as a survival tactic. That to me is a very different thing than saying, I don't, I don't believe it exists. Although denial is oftentimes the, the elegant cognitive solution to the same exact problem, right? Like it's too big, I'm too small, how am I gonna cope? Because otherwise I'm living in constant cognitive dissonance as psychologists call it, right? You've probably heard that term. Cognitive dissonance mean this, meaning that you, you, you have one set of values and one set of truths but you're actually living in a daily way that is in constant contradiction to that, right? This kind of cognitive dissonance of living in two different worlds. And I think the one solution to cognitive dissonance is nihilism and another solution might be denial, but they're, they're really quite different. Um, one, the, the latter very much being, I'm gonna find every way I can possibly believe to think this is not a big problem. Um, so yeah, has it helped the movement or is it, a, is, is it a problem for the movement and how bad of a problem it is for the movement? Um, yeah, so there's been recent um, recent big debates happening, really on the heels of David Wallace Wells' essay that Ken, you just mentioned, um, around this question of 
the doom and gloomers versus the denialists, which ones are worse for the movement, right? Do the people, we have long, the climate movement has long been worried about the denialists, right? We got to get more people on board. We got to get more people to care. We got to fight that 7% of the American population that are in adamant denial. They're just really well-funded and very vocal, even though they're actually only 7% or something like that, right? There's been a real mo movement in the climate movement for a good 20 years, you know, straight out of Al Gore to try to get more people convinced. We're shifting much more into swinging kind of this opposite direction where everybody is not only totally convinced, but they are totally in doom and gloom and in climate anxiety, you know, pits of despair and therefore can't do anything about it. So we're not, before we weren't doing anything about it because we didn't want to face it and now we've all faced it, but we were feeling apathetic because it's just so, so awful. And yeah, I'd say the end result is the same, right? The end result is that we're not acting on it. However, I do think I much more prefer working with that latter group, the kind of nihilistic group, the doom and gloomers, and say, look, you obviously really care. That's actually the big hurdle. Can, let's, let's sort of move back from there and figure out how we can plug that care into action, into feel, making sure you're feeling efficacious, into finding community, into not only reducing carbon emissions in the air, but making you actually feel like living on the planet, which feels to me like an important outcome of this work. Um, you know, the whole point of fixing the climate is that human beings thrive, right? So if we already undermine our own thriving by being so worried about the climate and our ineffectiveness of, about doing anything about it, we are actually doing capitalism's work for it, right? Like we're, we are actually surrendering our, our thrivance before we've even had to, right? So anyway, that's a, lot, that's a lot of different things woven in together, but the answer to the question is, yeah, the end result is the same, but I would really prefer work with the nihilists than the deniers any day. <laughs> Uh, that's a great question. And, and in a way, it kind of segues into the next one. And this is a distinctly US sort of question. Here it is. I feel the climate change would be more important to everyone if it wasn't as politicalized as it is in the US. Yes. And here's the big question for you, Sarah. How can we make it less so so the public is more organized and together about it? Yeah. Oh, gosh, if I could just do that. <laughs> <laughs> that would be the best thing, right? Yeah, and in other countries, like you look at Ireland, you look at lots of places that have de democracies with really entrenched political parties, climate change is not politicized the same way. It's very interesting how it's become politicized. I mean, but we see we saw that happen with COVID. We've seen that happen with all kinds of things that you think um, wouldn't have been politicized, right? Like that boat crashing into the bridge in Baltimore, politicized, right? Like, ah, uh, okay, so... We are now in a particular moment where nothing is off the table for being politicized. Um, and th that has its own sort of sets of stories and interesting explanations. And we need to start to tackle those things in its own set of solutions for sure. But about getting climate change depoliticized, the chapter in my book about be less right and more in relation really tries to get to this question. And my, my sort of overall answer to that is stop calling it climate change. I think it's a little bit of a radical proposition. Um, I can see the argument for maintaining the language, but part of the, one of the things that actually David Pello argues and many other people have argued in other places too, that the framing of the problem is where the politicization happens. And so if you frame a particular problem around things that are values in the political right, you can get climate change snuck in through the back door through all kinds of other values that people care about. For example, people really care about on the far right, um, the, some of the values that people talk about frameworks are things like uh, loyalty, virtue, family, um, all kinds of like patriotism, uh, values of um, morality, right? So like along those lines, using those frameworks, you can really get, you can make the case for climate change being an important value, right? And so using the frameworks and values of the particular audience you're talking to in order to draw the connections and make the dots between that thing and climate change is a, is a strategy that climate um, educators and communicators are using all the time. And here I, I really refer to the climate educator communication experts like Catherine Hayhoe who are doing this kind of work. Um, and also David Pello and other folks would mention that the sort of greatest, most the widest tent to fit climate change under that would capture the most people on all sides of the aisle is actually the frame of health. So some people are saying, 
let's stop, stop talking about climate change as an environmental problem and start talking about all the health problems related to climate change, because that is much more bipartisan and will mobilize people across the aisle. And we're seeing all kinds of research and evidence prove that this is in fact true, that health is a much better framework for uniting people around climate change. I don't think we're gonna have a success in getting everyone to say, yes, climate change is the problem. We are gonna have much more success getting people to act on climate change through other me mechanisms and other terms and other frameworks. That said, amazingly enough, when you think about the, what is required for a, like the critical mass to get a particular change to happen socially, there's a wide range of what people speculate, and I think it's kind of a bogus endeavor, but you only need something like 15 to 30% of a population to get radical change to happen. And so people have looked at past social movements and thought, how much of the population loved this idea when this policy was radically changed, right? Like we're seeing this also happen right now around the, the politics around abortion, right? The vast majority of the US has a particular stance on abortion and yet policy is changing in these other directions, right? So small, small, small percentages of people can have radical impact. And so, yeah, climate change, we may care about getting the far right or right wing to care about climate change. In fact, a lot of them already do, which is an interesting story that doesn't get told very often. We should use different frameworks and we also shouldn't worry about it too much because a vast majority of Americans actually are really concerned about climate change. The real question is not how do we get people to change their minds? The real question is to get that huge swath of about 55% of Americans to move from caring a lot about it to doing something about it. That is actually, I think, the far more interesting challenge. It's a little bit less um, discussed in popular media, but if you look at the numbers around how getting people to care and what the, this huge gap between caring and action uh, is a far bigger problem to address. Yeah, uh, excellent answer. So the next question might actually be kind of tied to that because it sort of focuses on intersectionality. So in your book, you claim that climate justice is tied to other social movements. How do you know which ones, i.e. which social movements to focus on first and what are some realistic things that people can do? Uh, can do in order to bring those movements closer together, do you think is that question meaning? Or just I, I, in general I, in one's life? And I think I think I think in general, but it's not clear from the question. So so however you want okay, to take I'll, it because yeah. you know. um, so to the question of what one can do, um, if you are feeling overwhelmed by these problems and they scare you, um, that is something to welcome and lean into. So I'd say the first thing to do is to not be afraid of how awful that feels and to then find other people who feel that way and not think that you're the only person and to know that's the reason why putting a, a label on climate anxiety has been an effective uh, strategy because it's mobilized people around their grief, around their anxiety, around mental health questions around climate. And then because of the mobilization and the, and the collectivities that have been caused by that, actions are increasingly happening. In fact, litigation laws are changing. Uh, politicians are being held accountable because of moral injury to young people across Europe and the US we're seeing that happen. So there's there's ways to leverage your emotional anguish for political change at the at the you know at the level of government, but also in your own life. So absolutely find your people, get to work, you know, lean into the discomfort because carrying on as status quo, business as usual, this is my life, cognitive dissonance, that's far more harming to the planet and to you mentally um, than, than you know, facing. It. So I'd say facing the emotions is the first step you can do, and it's the easiest one, frankly. I mean, it's right there, your emotions. You got yourself, dive in, right? Um, so, the, but to this question about the movements, uh, um, so the, the movements that I've really been tracing and seeing how they've affected the climate movement is the movement for black lives, the, move, the um, movements around um, Native American sovereignty, so things like Idle No More and um, Standing Rock and a couple other movements that have been happening really increasingly over the last you know, 10 or 15 years. Those movements have been really shaping the climate movement. The allyship around indigenous sovereignty, land back, um, figuring out how to get green colonialism to stop happening, and the climate movement has been really interesting to watch because there's been lots of frictions there too. So for example, in our community right here where I live, for many years, we've been talking about putting this huge offshore wind project to reduce our emissions and get our county and our state, you know, everybody's pushing for zero emissions. California's on the cutting edge of this. That's awesome, right? Well, in the last month, 
the, our largest tribe, we have a lot of tribes around here. Our largest tribe has actually come out against the wind farm project. And so once again, we have this question of, is indigenous sovereignty the key to a climate, you know, better climate future, or does it get in the way of a better climate future? These kinds of frictions are already happening in our community and in the climate movement all the time, right? So this, to me, the, the movements like indigenous movements, land back movements, uh, the movement for black lives um, have been sort of the biggest movements that have been shaping the climate movement to, to lean more towards justice. And I'd say um, something that's super interesting about all those movements is that they've been mostly predominantly led by young people. And I, that's pretty common. Social movements are, have often been driven by, mobilized by, uh, you know, the, basically resourced by young people. Uh, historically, that's true. There's reasons for that. Social movement theorists can tell you all the reasons for that. But it's pretty amazing how big an effect young people's movements around climate uh, and social justice matters um, around um, gun gun policy to um, those those organizing efforts have actually completely reshaped the climate movement towards a more justice lens and much attributed to young people in in various different demographics. So I yeah that that's it's complicated, but that would be what I'll put on the table for now. Yeah. Okay, um, another tough question. Um, does your work ever focus on anti-capitalism? As most anxieties of the younger generation, i.e. people in the room, focus on things like lack of housing, inflation, unregulated corporations, not being able to afford a house, build long-term wealth, and so on and so on, uh, are tied to this system, i.e. capitalism. Greta Thunberg mm -hmm. recently vocalized that climate, just, climate issues stem from capitalism, shifting her stance from liberal climate activism to anti-capitalist climate activism. Do you agree that climate change and activism should be uprooted from the main source, capitalism? Um, ah, the, such a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're answering ah. these and not me, by the way. <laughs> what did you say? I'm glad you're answering these and not me. Yes. Uh, these are, tough, these <laughs> are all tough easy. questions. Yeah. Oh, that was easy. This is a real, I uh, know, but this, this comes up in my classes all the time, too. So this is really alive. And um, I am deeply compelled, sympathetic, convinced by the anti-capitalism arguments around all of this. It is, in fact, the easiest way for us to see a systems analysis around if we have all of these different problems, like a whack-a-mole situation that all seem really disconnected, and we divide our energies you know, and divide among ourselves about which ones we're going to go solve. Oh, I'm going to go ally with indigenous tribes. Oh, no, I'm going to go ally with the zero waste people. Oh, no, actually, it's movement for black lives. No, it's this or that. The other, right, this sort of, sort of divide and conquer diffuses our collective power. And so capitalism is kind of the, the, sort of the elegant sort of one thing that ties it all together, right? So why don't we just tackle this thing at the root, right, the capitalist root? I am pretty convinced that that's, a, that's really effective. However, where I get, where the mud, waters get muddier for me, and I'm not sure where I stand on it, frankly, and I'm still navigating this, is should we throw out capitalism entirely or do we need to b improve it, right? And I am of the mind that you can make the case that capitalism entirely as a system is faulty and it is designed to be extractive both to people, labor, and natural resources. And certainly it is built to be racist, it's built to be patriarchal, all of the things. Racial ecology, racialized capitalism, I'm fully, I fully see that analysis and I'm with David Pellow on, you know, if the state is designed to build it, to extract capital from inequality, why would we want the state to be the thing that we use as our tool to fix problems? So I am convinced intellectually that these systems are inherently flawed. But I am not convinced that practically we can make progress on these things if we don't use the tools that are already dominant and in place at least a little bit for the sake of the transition. So I am a big fan of the just transition movement. I think that that is really where it's at for me in thinking about transition. And that movement very much believes in using the leverage points and leverage systems that we have in place to make the changes that we need to see. I would very much love to see greater regulation in the systems and states and capitalist regulation using, getting the price, the, the true cost of things correct. Um, I'd love to see, you know, ecosystem services actually measured better in 
the regulations that we have around corporations, I would really like to see all those things happen. All the time recognizing the real failures of the, a system that is built on a profit motive and growth as its pr primary value. I don't think that that is uh, aligned at all with a sustainable, thriving, pro, um, you know, life affirming. And when I say life affirming, I mean like people, all peoples, all beings thriving as much as we possibly can, maximizing that. I don't think you can have a profit motive at the same time as you have that. So I'm gonna, is that a, is that a neither here nor there kind of answer for you, Ken? <laughs> <laughs> so, so first of all, I think that was a terrific answer. I would have given a similar answer, but nowhere near as eloquently as you did. So, terrific. Yeah, <laughs> um, and and now we're going to go it's a great right on. Question. Thank you for asking it. Yeah. And yeah. We're going to kind of go back a little in time. So, next question. I feel re uh, I really like the perspective on how the root cause of climate change or genocide and colonialism of indigenous communities, such as communities, have made as such communities have made contributions to our biodiversity, environmental health prior to colonization. However, if one of the proposed solutions is to return the land back to the indigenous communities, how would we go about that? Or how would we incorporate their traditional, so two questions, either do that, which is, you can answer that. Or how would we, how could we incorporate their traditional knowledge in the current climate change movement? This is also a really big question that I don't feel like I have the best expertise to answer. And I do hope somebody will be coming to class maybe David Peller, I don't know who you might be having a class who could really speak to TK and, and Lamb back, but maybe there's somebody who can, who can speak to this. So I would defer to my more knowledgeable colleagues on that front. However, I, um, I do work closely with um, our chair of Native American Studies is a kind of Lamb back, um, a beautiful theorist. And uh, you can find her work on YouTube online. Her name is Kutcha Rizling Baldi. And her argument, if I can um, do my very best to summarize her argument around land back and TK, basically it is that there are, that the um, resistance to land back really is rooted in this fear that somehow native peoples cannot, uh, you know, there's a paternalistic view perspective that they're not gonna do the right things, that they don't really know how to do conservation or they're gonna just turn it into casinos or they're gonna just, exploit it because they've been held back for so long or something, right? There's this kind of paternalistic view that this is somehow not gonna result in ecological preservation. There are all mm -hmm. kinds of problems with that view, as you can imagine. So, so starting there, right? Secondly, it also comes from, the resistance comes from this notion that all, all of a sudden we're not gonna have uh, the concept of property ownership and the entire system will crumble and how that's not possible, so let's just forget about it. And I think actually what's really sophisticated about the land back movement is that they've come up with all kinds of tiered steps, staggered new ways of using the existing models of property ownership that we have to think about this in a creative, really outside the box kinds of ways. So for example, our local tribe here has a um, honor tax that you can pay towards that will then say basically, I am on WEOT land and I don't pay any taxes for that. I benefit from that, but I don't pay anything for that. So I'm going to compensate for that, that benefit somehow by giving the WEOT an honor tax saying, I'm on your land, this is a tax I'm gonna pay. So there's one way around that, one small way. Another way is actually to have indigenous folks uh, having the mortgage. So instead of paying the mortgage to a bank, have our mortgages be paid towards in, to tribes, why should they only have casinos as the main source of income? Why can't they participate in sort of a public banking system that would be, um, you know, that would somehow compensate a little bit or do some sort of reparation around how their resources and their finances and their health has been completely uh, exploited and undermined for the la from the last 150 years of genocide? So there, you know, there's all kinds of creative ways, and I could go on and list the things that I've heard. Um, when I hear about land back that are much more creative than just everybody leaving, you know, everybody who's not indigenous sort of leaving the land, that's not what I hear as a land back uh, solution. Um, and I actually am really excited about where those, some of those arguments are going. In fact, in Humboldt County, um, I'd say that there's some significant, we, that folks up here are really leading the way in land back. We've had multiple, almost every year, we have some big land back um, event happen, and it's just illustrating that it's indeed very possible. Um, thinking about the national park system, I think that seems like an easy one. The national park system could just be in the hands of indigenous peoples instead of the federal government and continue to operate the same way. 
and prioritize, maybe change a lot of those interpretive center signs and prioritize a TEK lens on, on resource conservation rather than a dominant Western lens? I mean, to me, these are the kinds of answers to this question that, that there are many, many new possibilities of how one might do that. Um, I think that's a great answer. There are many possibilities. I'd also add that 20% of U.S. land is in the hands of BLM, Bureau of Land Management. So anyhow, um, Sarah, I know we're, yeah. I only asked you to come for an hour, and I was going to kind of recap with the class, but do you have a couple more minutes? Because there are more questions here. I don't know if you have to run off. I'm okay if they're okay. <laughs> okay. So I won't, we won't keep you long. You but I just there's a lot of Because some, like, some of the questions, as... What's great about some of the questions here at the end is people are processing everything you're saying. They're beginning to put together like a whole view of things. But let me ask you this one here. Can you elaborate on the Buddhist ideals of Dharma and how that differs from our happiness-centered society? So really the focus there on happiness as the goal, I guess. Yeah, I think this student probably has their own set of answers to this, and I'd love to learn from this student um, too. Um, but so, yeah, the... The premise there being that in a Buddhist mindset, to the best of my ability to speak from this, and I should, I should caveat all this by saying I'm not a, a professional Buddhist, <laughs> so I am just, you know, stumbling through this stuff in the same way that many folks, um, many folks are, uh, and particularly motivated by socially engaged Buddhism, which is the Thich Nhat Hanh stuff that, um, that Ken was just talking about. So in a happiness-centered society, there's this idea of the hedonic treadmill, which is really fuels and fosters consumerism and constantly exposes us to all the places and um, where we need more stuff, right? That we need this, we need that, we need to keep up with that person. And it's an externally, um, it's like living in a house of mirrors where every, you're constantly looking at all the things that you lack based on what, what's being advertised to us and what we're being told we need to survive and function and be accepted by the tribe and that sort of thing. So the hedonic treadmill is basically, I'm going to continue to buy these things and the promise that it's gonna make me happy, but I'm finding that it's in fact not making me happy. And it's sort of like addiction, the way addiction works, where I have to keep going and even have to go bigger to keep getting that same hit, right? That dopamine hit, that kind of, oh, this is making me feel good for the moment, but then it all of a sudden doesn't last and I need it again. That's what the hedonic, the, the sort of notion of hedonism or that particular part of our brains that is pleasure centered, um, that just likes to have that like chocolate feelings right now, right? I just told you my weakness. Okay, chocolate. Um, so there's this idea of eudaimonia in contrast to that, which is more of a purpose centered life or a meaning centered life where we aren't really necessarily participating in this kind of pursuit of endless dopamine hits of so-called happiness. Um, or even for that matter, this kind of notion that we should be happy and therefore toxic positivity is the is crushing us, right? Instead, rather, finding a sense of purpose and meaning is more of a testament to whether or not we're gonna feel positive in our lives than whether or not we're happy or not. So it's just changing the metric significantly towards a more longstanding, uh, attainable, but harder to do um, type of, of effort in your life. And so, um, Sometimes uh, in the Dharma, in the Dharma universe, there's not there's this idea that uh, all the stimulus that's coming in at us, we either, we have immediate like our body immediately either grasps it, wants it, or it's trying to be averse to it, trying to push it away, right? Like if I'm feeling something like pressure from homework coming at me, I'm averse to it, so I go procrastinate. Or if oh gosh, I look at my phone, it's got some notifications on it, I'm going to be attracted to it, and I want to go on it, right? So everything in life is some level of something we are attracted to or something we want to push away from. And in Buddhism, the premise is, if you live your life in a constant moving towards and away from the things that are stimulating you, you're just going to be in this treadmill, right? This constant treadmill of struggle. And in Buddhism, the idea is that you become much more aware of your reactions to stuff, that you can find some pause or some freedom of choice in not reacting and observing how it is that you want to react, but then thinking through, what are my values? It, do I really want to go for this little thing that's right in front of me? Or is there some larger picture I'm trying to participate in? Uh, will that really make me happy? Will that really make me feel content? Or do I need to find equanimity and not let all of these winds blow me around? Um, so there's a, a sense of freedom that might come from at least becoming aware of how all the stimulus in our lives makes us either 
pull towards something or push away from something, and that we don't want to spend our lives in this constant pushing and pulling away and towards the stimulus that's around us and find some sort of equanimity um, in and, and sense of purpose in that. It's a really hard question to answer, but I love that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sticky. Yeah. So, so there are more questions, but I'm just going to give you one more. And for the people in the room, when Sarah ends, stay, because I still have to take Rowan. I want to say a couple of announcements. But here's your last question, Sarah. And this is what I said, you know, after assimilating it all, someone says, and again, there are many left, but this one, how can we face our environmental traumas, learn from them, and be better educators and advocators ourselves? Oh, my gosh. It's so beautiful. That is the goal right there. Yeah. So first of all, even saying that that's a goal is a huge thing. Um, to even talk about environment in terms of trauma is a huge revelation in most spaces right now. Um, and in fact, again, trauma, scholarship on trauma is very illuminating for us here. Again, we should be drawing very much in environmental and climate activism spaces and education spaces on the rich research that's happening on trauma. and. One of the insights there is this concept of post-traumatic growth, right? Instead of post-traumatic stress disorder, there's this sort of thinking about how is that people, are people kind of consigned to post-traumatic stress and just being kind of sort of disabled for lack of a better word for the rest of their lives with that? No, there's actually neuroplasticity that suggests that our brains can actually grow out of difficult experiences. And which isn't to say we should naturalize and, and approve of and let difficult experiences happen willy nilly with this idea that people can grow from it. However, but when we experience these kinds of trauma, there is the possibility through processing, through attention, through healing work, that we can turn trauma into greater resilience. This is where folks in trauma circles talk about the resilience zone getting bigger if you do work around trauma. And so, yeah, I'd say that the goal with, with experiencing any kind of trauma, including environmental traumas, is first of all, to bring environmental traumas into the conversation around trauma, not to think it's somehow separate from or different from other kinds of trauma. Um, but that our, the way that we react to those kinds of things can, in fact, um, improve our ability to deal with climate, climate change and other environmental traumas that are going to happen in the future. Again, to this point of stability, um, to, you know, having an unstable life is a kind of trauma. And having a climate, uh, climate create so much destabilization for us is going to be, if it hasn't already for you, a kind of trauma. And so trauma is absolutely the, the right set of lenses for us to, to move forward with that. Um, yeah, and you, it takes attention and work. And this is where I think the, the turn towards thinking about mental health around climate change is really great. People are starting to do that. That was an absolutely terrific, Sarah. Uh, absolutely terrific answer among many, many terrific answers. So thanks so uh, much for coming. It's been a, a great class. We've all benefited. So can we thank Sarah for coming? Thank you so much. It's so nice to see all your faces woke up there. People are moving out there. <laughs> oh, yeah, they are. But don't move out of the room yet. OK, Sarah, thanks so much. Um, okay. We'll talk before next year, but definitely, you know, Plan next year, too. OK, thanks, I'd love Sarah. to. If you keep doing this, I have so much fun. Thank you all so much. I'm very honored by your attention. Okay. So folks, OK, let me go down here. OK, I am taking roll on the eye clicker. If you've had eye clicker problems, Ian is here. I'm not sure if Meet is here. But if for some reason it didn't register, you're having issues, see Ian before you go. You can have a list of, uh, he'll make a list of people who were here that didn't get registered. And um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. If you um, like this format, we'll be doing it for the rest of the term, so. Okay, thanks.